First question that came up. A little bit involved with the question, but I think we can get to the bottom of it. I'm wondering if we talk about spiritual death, and we'll have to clarify what we mean by that, then how do we notice this on a daily basis? For instance, if we do something good for someone else and put our own needs and wishes aside as a conscious choice, is that spiritual death? Uh, another example, choosing to be helpful for a neighbor instead of a joyful meeting with somebody else we have planned or any other example we can think of when putting aside our own wishes. I hope this question makes sense. Yes, it does, but I'm wondering whether my immediate thoughts when, upon reading this question was, is it really, is talking it about things in terms of spiritual death, is that really the best way of putting things across? Well, I mean, what we're talking about here is putting ourselves out for other people as part of our spiritual journey. So developing the capacity to experience discomfort for the benefit of somebody else is very good for our own spiritual journey. And my thought about this is that ultimately where we want to be in terms of the meditation is fully developing what in Buddhism we call the five spiritual faculties, faith, energy, mindfulness, concentration, and investigation. When those five qualities of mind are really mature and really developed, our meditations are very, um, they've got a, a, an amazing foundation. They're very steady. The mind is bright, it's focused, it's able to look at experience unfolding and understand it for what it is. So when it comes to insight meditation, we really do want this really, really firm sort of meditative power. And these are what we call the five spiritual faculties. And what's absent with those five spiritual faculties is any self-concern. So when we have a really, really um, strong meditation, strong in these qualities, it's... Um, what's absent is the self-concern. And now when we think about meditation, when there are lots of hindrances, when the meditation is easily disturbed, when there's a lot of restlessness, where there's a uh, lot of sensual desire or ill will, or wanting to get away from the meditation, what's it full of? It's full of self-concern, right? So then the question then becomes is, well, how do we lessen self-concern and develop these five spiritual faculties so that they're very, very strong. And well, practicing meditation every day, obviously is hugely important, but what's also important in developing those spiritual faculties, letting go of self-concern, is the development of compassionate activities where we're willing to put ourselves out for the benefit of other people. And so it's part of the training, training in what we call the parami, generosity, being ethical, uh, practicing renunciation, energy, uh, putting forth our energy for the benefit of other beings. Uh, they're all aspects of compassionate activity. So these examples are perfect examples of someone developing the parami. So we develop the parami, um, compassionate activities in order to reduce levels of self-concern and develop uh, these five spiritual faculties. So throughout the training in meditation, being ethical, living by precepts and developing compa compassionate activities run through the, the entire course of the training. And what we find is they, they help tremendously at bringing this really strong meditative power to our practice. Yeah. So I know people talk about like ego death <laughs> and this very sort of like grandiose language. It's not like that at all. Yes, there are, there are times when our assumptions about the way 
we think life is are brought under scrutiny through our practice. And that's exactly what we're doing it for. And so the, the, the less self-concern there is and the more power in those spiritual faculties we have, the easier it is to pass through those occasions. But there's nothing dies <laughs> in the course. The only things that die in the course of this training are your illusions, your delusions, and your tendency to crave for life to be different <laughs> than it is. So the only thing that dies is suffering and the causes of suffering. Um, life itself carries on as normal. So I think just sometimes we just have to be a bit careful with the language that we use. Um, there's no, yeah. That, that's, that, those are my initial thoughts about the question. Does anybody have anything they'd like to add? Anything about that that they would like to talk about? Another, a, 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 a wonderful example, a few examples I can think of where we willingly give up our self-concern when we're listening to a really beautiful piece of music and we get really absorbed in that piece, piece of music, when we're out in nature and we're, we're in a state of awe through the, the, the majesty and the magic of nature, when we're deeply engrossed in watching a movie or deeply engrossed in uh, watching a football match, or when we are in a deep state of concentration. In all those instances, there is a, a, a palpable lack of separation, a, pa a palpable lack of perception of div any kind of division. There's an absorption in the moment and there's the total letting go of all self-concern. And it's delightful in every case. It's that lack of division, that lack of sense of separation is blissful, joyful, rapturous, I mean, to different degrees. I mean, I'm not saying watching a football match will necessarily send you into raptures. It could, unlikely, but it could. Getting into a really deep state of concentration definitely brings up states like rapture, sublime sense of peace, and there is no self-concern there whatsoever. So we can determine from that that there is a dissolving of boundaries. And that's what this teaching is leading us towards, the dissolving of our attachment and our ignorant grasping after division. And with the dissolving of um, that ignorant grasping, there is a release which is blissful. You can get it through concentrated states, but with insight meditation, with Pasana, you go a stage further and you actually, you come to realize that the presumed separation between myself and the world is a presumed separation and it has no basis in reality. And that dissolving of that ignorant grasping is the uh, realization of freedom from suffering. So nothing actually dies other than a mistaken idea about reality. There is no, <laughs> I mean, that's pretty unfortunate if you're meditating and you do die. Or maybe, I mean, maybe that's probably one of the better ways to go. I would have thought, I mean, we all have to go. So that was a bit grim, Paul. But uh, anybody got any thoughts about that? anywhere you'd like to take that conversation. Do you see the need for compassionate activity? Do you see how it benefits you as a meditator to be willing to experience the, the discomfort of having to go out of your way to help somebody else? Jim. Hi, Paul. Um, uh, yeah, I'm, I guess the thought that comes to mind is, is when you're in a partnership, you're living with somebody or you have a family, there are numerous examples of times when 
your help is wanted or you have the chance to surrender to that need or you can, I'm not sure where I'm going, but <laughs> the two thoughts that come to mind are one, it reminds you that this person also has needs. This person isn't really fundamentally different from me. They, they, uh, they don't live a life of perfect harmony either. Um, secondly, though, the other thought that comes to mind is, well, my particular partner right now is a little pushy. And then sometimes I have to think about, well, how, how much do I give her <laughs> before I start becoming a doormat? Um, when do I have to talk, stand up and, you know, look at the balance between her needs and my needs. Um, yes. And it's a balancing act. And then I'm still not sure I'm hitting the right note on that one, but I, I do look at it a lot. Um, I think that's a very good point, Jim, because that's developing your wisdom. Yeah. Developing your mundane wisdom. You know, wisdom is one of the parami. So it's, and it's all about balance. But like one of the mistakes that people make with the parami is that they see the translation of the word as perfections. And, and the assumption is that the perfection of these qualities is, you know, using them 100% of the time, all the time. Like we're back to this idea of the saint, you know, the, the saintly person who wouldn't say boo to a goose. And that's not what perfection means. Perfection in this context means finding the balance because you cannot become enlightened through just performing compassionate activities. So it's got its place in the teaching, but it's not the whole of the teaching. And so it's recognizing that there has to, the perfection of the parami is in finding the balance, mm. finding the balance between being helpful to somebody else and retaining. Oh, what we've got going on there is is somebody could could everyone make sure that you're on mute? Pam, could you make sure you're on mute, please? Thanks. Um, yes, so it's knowing it for experience where to draw the line. Um, one of the things I, I, I try to employ is look for patterns rather than individual um, errors or you know, points of controversy. Look, look for a pattern of behavior rather than believing that you have to stamp out every little fire every little incident that, that comes your way, because, because otherwise you're micromanaging and, and nobody is happy. So you, if you wait for the pattern to emerge and then deal with the pattern and you've got evidence to support you, then that's, you know, that's one of the ways I've found that you, you can retain a, a compassionate outlook. Um, but there are, there are also reasonable boundaries that you, that you have to keep and it's not compassionate for instance, to say yes to somebody, especially a child, it's not, it's not compassionate to them just to give in to their, their every whim. You have to have boundaries. And so it's learning where the balance is. It's, that's the perfection of them. Plus the recognition that you cannot resolve the problem of suffering externally. You have to do the meditative work. You have to gain the insights into the true nature of reality. And so that compassionate activity has its place. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And as long as you understand that, if you understand that context, then you're, you're good to go. Is that, does that, does that cover it? That's for me. Yeah. Mark, you have your hand up. Yeah, thanks, Paul. I, um, the, the phrase that really interests me that you used was the, the phrase was, um, grasping after division, um, and I and it sort of occurred. I was sort of reflecting. I'm not sure I've ever, I've ever sat in a meditation and and kind of noted that I'm grasping after division. It's like um, I and so what I, my question is, I guess, is 
do you mean that um, grasping for um, looking for a self is is that is that what you mean by grasping after a division or ac acting out of the assumption of selfhood it is assuming that these feelings are mine it's, it's assuming that these thoughts are mine you know, these mental formations are mine these this consciousness is mine that's that is grasp that is the ignorant grasping after the divided state it's reinforcing the sense of division and yet when there's no self referencing when there's no self referral when there is just simply abiding in being it's there's there is no sense of separation and it's it's lovely so so yeah so it's because we need we, we have to realize we need the divisions it's just we're seeing through the solidity of them. We're seeing that they they don't define reality. That they are, you know, they um, they are empty of any inherent reality. But we still need the divisions at the mundane level in order to, you know, live our lives and converse and so forth. But we're so really rather than the the divisions between things, it's really dissolving the ignorant grasping after those divisions. Right. That's, that's, I'd say that's what I'm trying to say. Thank you. I hope that helps. It, I, I'm probably not explaining it as, as well as I did when I thought about all this. <laughs> thought about all this first. And when you say it, it comes out more different. Mandy, hello. Hi Paul. Um, <clears throat> yes, when I came across the word spiritual death, um, uh, I really liked. I really liked that word. I thought it was a fancy way of <laughs> talking about the transience of everything as well. And then I thought, okay, how how is that then? How do we see the transience in daily life? And but then I think I also connected it too much with an existing ego then if i understand you correctly and um, ego yeah. isn't actually a buddhist word but it's one that we sort of liberally co-opt what we really mean is whenever we are resistant whenever there is resistance that's what we, you know the, the shorthand is we say it's you know it's, it's the ego but it it is it is where the mind is in opposition to unfolding reality, right? Yeah. And that's where that's what we call that's what we call self-concern. So when I'm concerned for myself, I'm not concerned for other people. Other people are just there to either be used by me or, you know, um, ignored by me or whatever. But the primary focus is me so it's reinforcing the sense of division it's reinforcing the sense of myself as separate from the rest, rest of the world yeah. and so when we act on behalf of others we are undoing that tendency we are we are just you know just smoothing away that tendency by learning that there is a benefit to us from helping other people so not only the other person gets help of course that's that's primary, but we also know it's it's helpful to us. An example I remember from many many years ago was when I I don't know if I've mentioned it before, but I was in a three car um, pile up. Well, it wasn't really a pile up; it was just like a, a prang coming together at a traffic lights, and I was in the the middle car. So there was a car in front of me and a car behind me, and I got got shunted both sides. And for whatever reason, this this sort of mentality kicked in which was like oh i'm fine i just need to help these other people and which which i did and made sure everyone was um okay and we had to get an ambulance for, for the woman in the front car and there were witnesses and all this sort of stuff going on and and one of the witnesses didn't had missed his bus <laughs> and so i offered to take him home which was very unlike me my youthful me was not concerned about other people. It was just concerned about me. 
so I took him home and then I was going over to my girlfriend's house and and I explained what had happened to her and she said Paul you look a foot taller and I understand what she meant she meant that there was this sense of self-worth because I'd done the right thing and it was something that was very unusual for me at that time and that that sense of you know sort of like spiritual maturity in that moment uh, it doesn't mean that you're permanent in that state of spiritual maturity but it, it 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 showed me that I had that capacity and I, at that time I was operating out of that and I and I felt a foot taller it was true and that's what the compassionate activity gives you if you're willing to surrender so if you want to swap the words spiritual death to surrender maybe that it's surrendering that self-concern for the benefit of others. Does that does that help, Mandy? Yes, and I, and when I walked through the port, I thought maybe actually you know it's in everything. So it's transience in itself. Uh, it, it, it's not per se about the, the the it's not about the ego as as ego as what we talk about or as a concept about it's about everything that changes transient seeing the transients in daily life and everything is what maybe we can see a spiritual death does that make sense paul yeah i mean it, it's not we well, see the thing is a, the, the two words spiritual like there isn't an actual spirit not in, not in buddhism there isn't a soul there you know that so for me spiritual is like this sort of like all-encompassing word for for the you know the mat- you know the maturing of uh, a human being that takes into account their psychology their emotions you know their physical world their ethics you know everything and and their sense of the transcendent and the sublime they're all aspects of what makes up a human being so in that sense that is not going to die <laughs> that's not going to die at all those qualities are just going to get stronger and stronger so I think if it's the death of anything, it's the death of ignorance, it's the death of illusion, it's the death of delusion, it's the death of craving, it's the death of suffering through uh, undertaking all these spiritual practices. Uh, there is nothing to die. What people call death is just the, the, the dissolving of all barriers. There's, there's no death, there's just... The, all the known barriers, all the assumed barriers are just are just dissolve away. Um, which is why in the Tibetan tradition, they say death is an opportunity to realize the boundless. But because people have this pre-assumed sense of their own separateness, boundlessness, fear, the dissolution and dissolving of all boundaries is extraordinarily threatening so that's what prompts rebirth so there is the desire for um, the ability to perceive oneself as separate again so so yes so death is simply the dissolving of all boundaries which is exactly the same thing as love love is the dissolving of all boundaries when you fall in love with somebody there is no boundary there is no there is there's no sense of separation that comes back when you start criticizing and finding faults in the other person and then that takes a whole lifetime of trying to work out but there is that moment blissful moment of total surrender to the other and the the letting go of boundaries yeah thank you so in that sense it's spiritual death yeah (laughs) sally yeah, that made me think of something we were talking about on the Facebook group about self-pity and self-concern and what the differences between the two might be. And you've got me thinking about it all now um, in relation to, say, a, a really bad illness. So I have a colleague that's just been diagnosed with leukemia who's a few years younger than me. And it's knocked us all for six at work. We're really sort of shocked by it. 
and you've got me thinking about self-concern in that sort of environment where I can imagine you're bound to have a lot of self-concern because you're very poorly and I keep trying to put myself in her place and she's not she's not a Buddhist I don't think she practices any particular sort of belief system or anything really but I often wonder how it would relate to say a serious illness how you tackle that well I mean self-pity self -pity in that situation would be me getting all upset because my colleague at work has got leukemia and it all being about me and my my feelings because somebody else has got leukemia. So it's it's sort of like it's taking center stage and making it all about me. <laughs> yeah? Whereas yeah. it's only, it's completely understandable to feel compassion and to feel a sense of what that person might be going through. Although, you know, it's, it's sometimes difficult to be able to, to tell, but, you know, to put yourself in their shoes and to say, oh, that must be awful. And there will be, of course, there will, you know, it won't feel nice. But, mm. but this is where if we're meditators, we can employ, this is the perfect opportunity to employ this thing of just going into that experience, into that mental quality, experiencing the discomfort of it and dissolving it through um, throwing the light of your awareness upon it and going, yes, this is self you know, if it, you know, this is, this is uncomfortable. I do feel sad. There is a sadness. And to experience that sadness fully, it's not about trying to get rid of states. It's about understanding them. And if you do that, you don't tend to then wallow in self-pity. You then, you tend then to, ex having experienced it, to feel more soft, a softness for that other person and a softness for, for oneself. We're all mortal. It could happen to any one of us. Yeah. Jackie James, who was the, the founder of the center, died what, age 41 of leukemia. Wow. So it can happen anytime to any, any one of us. So it's that, you know, that's, it's that emp empathy, isn't it? It's mm. being able to empathize with somebody else's plight. And, f and feel a little bit of what it, they must be going through, that's entirely laudable. It's only when it then is, is sort of um, transmuted into being all about me, you know, oh my, oh, I'm so sad, my friend, you know, you see what I mean? Yeah. It wasn't so much that I meant really, it was more, uh, I was trying to imagine if it was you, if it was you going through that, how would you deal with that? by going yeah. through this path. Well, say you did have a diagnosis, how would you deal with it? Yeah, because and yeah, and I, I think that's that's fair. Um, and if you're a Buddhist meditator, I'd, I'd say that you would bring mindfulness and equanimity to the fore. And, you know, it doesn't mean that you don't get treatment, but it means that you, it is about surrendering to the new reality and going through that process, experiencing the painfulness of it, the difficulties of it, willingly, mm. you know. Um, again, if you get caught up in emotionality, then it's, again, it's becoming about me rather than the other person yeah. again. But like, so that's the empathy thing. It's just, it's being able to empathize, seeing the difficulties you know, sort of reviewing it in your own mind and seeing the difficulties that this person must be going through. But to take it further mm. and then to become kind of like mentally enabled, unenabled, <laughs> unable to help that person because you're so caught up in it. Yeah. You know, that that's that's an error. I mean, they're going through it. You're not going yeah. through it. They're going through it. So if you are able to acknowledge what, you're going through mindfully you are more able you're able to dissolve it and therefore be able to far more able to be there for that other person naturally and the other thing about this is not idealistic we're all limited none of us are jesus 
you know we've all got limitations and we work within our limitations you don't again it's coming back to this idea of balance mm. you know it's it's like uh that person has to go through that's their journey you've empathized with them you understand where they're coming from a little more and you're able to deal with your own emotions so that you're able to be of help to them but you still got to get on with your life yeah thank you okay annie hello you need to you need to unmute annie just wanted to check did you say alan james died of leukemia jackie james his wife ah thank you because that shocked me then right oh no he's 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 fine alan. <laughs> he's, he's fine don't worry <laughs> yeah okay um did anyone else have so jeff uh sorry i called you jeff leslie i do apologize Uh, you need to uh, unmute there, Leslie. I there. hadn't expected to talk there, but uh, the question about Jackie James uh, made me think of something. Uh, when she was very unwell, I was working with someone who was spending a lot of time um, down with you guys in Bradford. I remember her telling me about it and she, her, the way that she reacted to it was how traumatizing it was for her to realize that all this uh, calmness and meditation and ev everything that Jackie did, because apparently she was quite inspiring. Um, and then this happened. And, and it shouldn't have happened, you know, Buddhists, people who are enlightened should live forever. <laughs> and of course, I now know that they do in a, in a way. But uh, I remember being quite shocked at uh, how traumatized she was about Jackie's uh, demise. Yeah, faith, no wisdom. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Faith, no wisdom. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. I mean, like, I, I, I you know, I, I have to say, I, f I find it quite laughable, th you know, that someone could fall into that kind of trap, yeah. uh, you know, where their thinking is at, that they that they are traumatized by somebody else getting leukemia. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. Like, and and how does how 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 does spirit spiritual insight all the way up to the realization of unboundedness? How does that stop you from the physical body from decaying? Yeah. I mean, it's all right. There's a place for everyone in the world, and there's yeah. you know, it's, the, yeah. it's not the person; it's the ideas. But I mean, I have to say, I mean, I, I'd heard the same thing. I'd heard this, that uh, Alan had told me that uh, there were people that had left the centre because Jackie James had died. Wow! And that therefore all bets are off. You know, it's like, well, <laughs> that couldn't have been. I mean, oh. I can, I can say, I can say it's the ideas of the people. <laughs> <laughs> so, as soon as this was a very, she was a very intelligent woman, and uh, and I knew nothing at all about um, Buddhism at the time. But I do remember thinking that there was some something wrong with it. Yeah. Um, anyway, thank you. Yeah. Th well, thanks. Thanks for pointing that out, Leslie. It's it, it's again. See, it's all about her. It wasn't about Jackie, it was about her. Mm. <laughs> That's where it goes wrong. Mandy, uh, I, did you wanted another go? Yes, please. Yeah, yeah. I can't let go of it, Paul. I can't let go of the word spiritual death, you see. <laughs> oh, you love it. You love it. <laughs> oh, sorry. You, know, you were just saying, like, nothing really dies. And then I think, well, every moment is dying, it's coming and dying, isn't it? So maybe, yeah, I'm just getting my. Yes. Yes, yeah, yeah. All, all things, all things die. Yeah, and all every, things, every moment all comes. things arise, all things pass away. But there is also the, but every, oh, it, it's, it's difficult with language. <laughs> there, right. is, there is unboundedness. Unboundedness has no delineation. 
It neither arises nor passes away. It is uncreated. It is total security. And it is also endless creative playfulness, which takes form through conditions, takes form, but every formed thing dissolves. So it's, every formed thing is an appar is apparitional. It, 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 it appears to be there. There appears to be there appear to be separate things, but all those separate things are illusory. And seeing through the dance, seeing through the playful creativity, seeing that in fact there is nothing arising, there is nothing passing away, in any absolute sense, is freedom. It's perfect, unqualified freedom. Things still arise and pass away. So there is unboundedness, and then the, there is the binding into thingness. All those things are apparitional. They're not absolute realities. They're, they're phantoms. Yeah. So in reality, nothing is originated. Nothing passes away. And, and it's just seeing through, it's just seeing through it. That's what the purpose of this training is, to realize that there, there is simply unboundedness. Freedom from all limitations. But if you think about that, if you go a little bit deeper into that, if you have no boundaries, you can have no playful creativity, because playful creativity requires there to be things. So embedded in this unboundedness, which can't be known by the functioning mind because the functioning mind has to delineate things and say, that's one of those, that's one of them. As part of the whole package, you get the unboundedness, which is the total security. And then you get, you get there's also the chance to play, the creative play of existence. And it's just recognizing that those two things are not separate. That's what this is. And so you've never, you've never been denied it. It's, it's not something that you have to look for. What we're doing with the meditation is we are voluntarily looking at the, the thingness of things and seeing that they're transient, that they arise and pass away due to conditions and they're ungraspable. And through that process, you surrender all your attachment, you surrender all your resistance. And in the, in the end, you, you surrender everything, all thingness, all division, and what's left is the unbounded, is unboundedness, the boundlessness of reality. So it's, you know, to seek for it is, is to ignore it. So what we do instead is we look at the, the thingness of things, a sound, a thought, a feeling, a perception, sensation. We keep noting things and noting how they arise and pass away and that you can't grasp them. There is nothing to grasp onto. There is no substantial reality to it. Simples. <laughs> <laughs> it's only complicated when you have to talk Thanks. about it. Thanks. Yeah, no, really, really helpful. Okay, so we've got another question, <laughs> which from one end of the spectrum to the other, this is, this is going, going in full on the, the other end of the training. Um, hi, Paul. If fruitions are momentary, transient, and require lots of work to achieve, what security is there in them? Okay, so... That needs a little bit of explanation. I'll just repeat the question. If fruitions are momentary and transient and require lots of work to achieve, what security is there in them? Which is uh, an interesting question. Just to clarify what we mean by fruition. So as somebody practices insight meditation and they're, they're learning to set aside hindrances and they're gaining purity of mind on a regular basis. They turn their attentions 
to look at the arising and passing away of phenomena. And there is a field of phenomena and we are so we are so familiar with this field of phenom phenomena, we just don't look, we don't see it, we don't look at it. And it's the sights, the sounds, the tastes, the touches, the smells. It's the seeing, the hearing, the smelling, the tasting, the touching. It's uh, thoughts, feelings, um, memories, perceptions, all kinds of mental formations, thinking, thinking about the past, thinking about the future the, what we call the building blocks of reality. And we are looking, specifically looking at the building blocks that go to make up any conscious experience in order to know directly that all these building blocks of experience are entirely transient, unsatisfactory because they're ungraspable, because they're transient, and that everything is arising and passing away due to impersonal conditions. And there is no self in any of these conditions whatsoever. And four times in the course of the insight training, there are what I presume is the equivalent of what they call Satori in Zen, although don't quote me on that. But there is this moment when the insights into the three marks, transience, unsatisfactoriness and non-self becomes so mature and so strong that the mind in a moment gives up its obsession with the occurrence of phenomena arising and passing away and becomes aware of that which neither arises nor passes away. So realizes in that moment unboundedness, the boundless, that which is not originated, that which doesn't pass away and is therefore secure and um, peaceful. So it's genuine, genuine security, the realization of true peace. And there's a finger snap where the mind, because of the maturity of the insight knowledge, just for that moment, gives up its obsession with the occurrence of things and sees, sees that which neither arises nor passes away. And we call that the super mundane path and fruition. So there is the insight that leads to the discovery of that which does not arise and pass away. And then there is, that is the fruition. And then there is the mind then returns to its obsession with the occurrence of things again. And so the questioner is asking, well, if that's such a fleeting moment and it's taken such a long time to experience that, how can there be any security in that? Well, the security is not in the fruition. The security is in Nibbana, the boundless, that which neither arises nor passes away. And it's like the fruition, the path of the fruition is just like the opening of a window. It's just going, do you see what's really there? And then the window closes again. So the fruition is not the thing. It's going through the fruition, the full fruitions that are the necessary prerequisite for full total enlightenment. With the realization of full total enli enlightenment, there is no opening and closing of a window. There is just, ah, <laughs> there's just the realization of the true nature of existence, which is boundless. So it's like just this window opening for a moment, a little flash of what's true and then that window closes again because the mind is still obsessing about things arising and passing away it's still obsessing in some way shape or form with samsaric existence so so that's why it is that fruitions are momentary um, they're transient they're not nibbana they are a momentary flash of boundlessness, which are absolutely necessary in order to, to finally reach the point where there is a total surrender. Um, so that's my answer to that question. Thank you for the person who asked that question. If you want to say hello, you're very welcome to. Does anyone have any thoughts about that? Mark? 
only the um uh what was my thought <laughs> Oh, yeah. Yeah. Is it? <laughs> <laughs> only that the um I, I uh i my understanding is not not my experience my understanding is that the fruitions do remove some of the fetters in each um each fruition yes yes um it's it's a little bit tangly but really what what it is that cuts through the fetters are the insight knowledges that arise prior to the fruition. So it's like, you've got to cut the cord and then the fruition happens. So, so really it's the insight prior, like for instance, uh, uh, a personal example, I had one of the fruitions while I was shaving. Uh, not that I do that, I have to do that. See, this is why I don't have to shave now. <laughs> No, what I mean is, is like there was, if I remember rightly, there was the arising of subtle hatred. And there was the clear seeing that the hatred was arising upon painful feeling. The painful feeling was arising upon sensory contact. That sensory contact was a memory. And so there was the total seeing of condition dependent origination in regard to that subtle hindrance of hatred. And there was the total knowledge that there was no self in that experience, that it all arose and passed away due to impersonal conditions. And that was breaking through the fetter of subtle hatred. And upon that, there was then the arising of the supramundane path and fruition. Yeah. So there was first, there was the breaking free of the fetter through insight. And then there was that moment of total release from obsession with the arising passing way of things. And just for a moment, the mind alighted on that which does not arise and pass away. But then the, the window snapped shut again, because <laughs> there's still there are still more fetters to deal with. So it's only at the point where all the fetters are dealt with, the, the things that are binding you to the sangsaric view of existence, the dualistic view of existence, it's only once all the fruitions are dealt with that it's then possible for the realization, the total realization of boundlessness. Yeah. So you're you're absolutely right, but it's such a small, you know, <laughs> you know, we're yeah. dealing with such subtleties of of experience that um, to say that yeah, it's the fetter that breaks the. Okay, so small points. Small point, yeah. Thanks, but man. well worth bringing out. Thank you. Yeah, that that is the reason why we have to go through the four insight paths. Um, yeah, subtle point. I appreciate that that's not particular a conversation. You know, that is necessarily uh, ripe for. <laughs> further discussion although peter hello oh i was going to ask um when someone goes through the full training and then becomes enlightened is it like they've really i don't this is probably the wrong words to use but but checkmated the self in that they've looked at every single aspect of reality and how it presents itself and they've seen it to be not self and they've seen through the whole whole shebang of it and they know there's nothing more that they can possibly do yeah um <clears throat> I, th I think that um that's absolutely right that every component of the field of phenomena arising and passing away it's been looked at from every conceivable angle and the transient, ungraspable, unsatisfactory, conditioned and impersonal nature of every component part that goes to make up every experience has been understood to be entirely um, without core, without any self in it whatsoever. Mm -hmm. But my experience was that wasn't the end of the, the story, that there remained, still remained, 
the the attempt to locate, to find, to understand nibbana, nirvana, boundlessness, using the functioning mind. Now, the functioning mind divides, consciousness divides, perception mm. divides, thinking divides. That's all we've got available to us, and we have used it up. We've done everything we can use consciousness, perception, and thinking for in terms of this path. And it brings us right to the threshold, but it's done its job. It can't do any more. And it's very difficult to put across, but the functioning mind cannot understand boundlessness. But when the functioning mind realizes its own inadequacy, it gives up. And what's left mm. is boundlessness. And then there's the conscious arising and a perception arising and the thought arising. Oh, that's boundlessness, which immediately divides it again. But the mm. mind understands that. The mind under there is the understanding that the mind itself cannot understand it. it it remains completely mysterious but at the same time it is understood to be everything it's quite yeah. out there it totally is so the point is you you reach the point so in my own case i was still fettered by the idea of enlightenment itself which kept open this division between me and the enlightened state the idea of me and the idea of an enlightened state that was a division and it was it was with the final giving up of the attempt to locate it that meant that's what was left but when the, yeah. mind, the functioning mind tries to un comprehend it they can only see it from this point of view or from that point of view it can't see the whole <laughs> this is going to sound very odd peter but can you fit your head inside your mouth? Give it a go. No. <laughs> <laughs> <Go on, then. laughs> <laughs> no, you can't. The, the, the part cannot contain the whole. Hmm. Yeah. And when the functioning mind understands that it's the part, not the whole, it lets go. Uh, yeah, I understand. Yeah, yeah. It's it's so it's so impossible to describe. So it's not something that happens, it's happening. It's always happening because it doesn't arise and it doesn't pass away. It's always it always is in that sense. Yeah. So there is nothing to find. It's just so no, no, nothing's coming. really changed at all. Oh yeah. <sighs> But the understanding from, yeah, changed. everything's changed everything's changed so from from the enlightened perspective the arising and passing way of things still carries on but is all seen to be nothing but an expression everything this is an expression of the divine mystery mm. from the point of view of somebody who still believes in self and assumes has assumes still is assuming selfhood it's seen to be just ordinary. So there's a huge mm. difference. It's, it's seismic, the difference. Mm. Yeah. And so people who still see it all in terms of self still get bored. Somebody who has realized boundlessness is never bored. Everything that is arising is a magic show. <laughs> Of the most astonishing proportions. It's just utterly delightful. Mm. But it still contains boredom. Uh, now, boredom's a special case. It's impossible to be bored. Mm. Um, but, you know, well, well, it's impossible for the enlightened being to be bored. Somebody who has realized boundlessness from that point on never experiences boredom. But the possibility, the potential for boredom, yes, because mm. the, un the unbounded boundlessness contains all possibility within it. So it includes ignorance. It includes grasping. 
It has the potential for ignorance. It has the potential for grasping. It has the potential for ign ignorantly grasping after the idea of self. So, yeah, so it's, it's, such a, it's such a weird thing. So seen from the perspective of enlightenment, yeah, all those defiling states have the potential to rise, but not arise within the, the enlightened being. Well, no more than, you know, sort of like, you know, a momentary arising and then, then passing away. It's like, there's nothing to, there's no grasping. So there is nothing to, to keep it, hold it in being. Oh, I see what you mean. Yeah, it's not like a set state. It's just arising and passing away. Yeah. It's impossible. See, the difficulty is you cannot understand it through thinking about it. Because thinking necessarily divides things into mm. things. You know, you can't think other than about things. <laughs> it's impossible. So you, so boundlessness remains uh, un unimaginable, unthinkable, glorious. And, and yet it, it can utterly be understood at the same time, it's just beguiling, utterly beguiling. And, that, and that's what the, where the Buddhist path takes you.